You know, fan games are really cool. I know some game companies take issue with their existence, but speaking personally, I think it's really cool to see fans show their love for a game series by doing their own take on something with the IP. I suppose it's no different than fan art or fan fiction in that regard, but given the medium in question, fan games just kinda hit a bit more, if that makes sense. Not to discredit fan artists or fan fiction writers, just to clarify. Though something I think is even cooler than fan games is when a fan game developer is inspired to take the experience they've got under their belt and make something brand new with it. To name one example, we've got Brazilian developer Felipe Ribeiro Danilus. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Also known as Lake Pfeffer. He first made himself known in the Sonic fan community with his quite popular Sonic fan games. 2011's Sonic Before the Sequel, 2013's Sonic After the Sequel, and 2014's Sonic Chrono Adventure. However, after the release of Chrono Adventure, Lake Vapor decided to take what he had learned from those fan games and make his own indie title. And thus, in the summer of 2015, a Kickstarter page went live for his original indie game, Spark the Electric Jester. Now the Kickstarter page specified that the majority of the game's initial development was done, and that the Kickstarter money would largely be to fund the soundtrack and sound design, hence why the campaign goal was only $7,000. But hey, it did indeed hit that goal, and the game went on to come out on Steam in April of 2017. Now I've heard talk here and there about Spark since it came out, but I never really paid it much mind until more recently. I finally played it for the first time not too long ago, and I gotta say, whoa. It was definitely more than I was expecting. But now that the history lesson's wrapped up, how's about we talk about the game itself? The game begins with a narration from our hero, Spark. A formy, that's what his species is called, with some really bad luck regarding careers. He had gotten a degree in electrical engineering, but was only able to keep his robot maintenance job for a year before being replaced by, well, a robot. But using the jester hat he created that allowed him to conduct electricity, he was able to land himself some work as a circus performer, only to, once again, be replaced by a robot a month into the job, this time with the robot eerily looking like himself. This left Spark jobless and now unable to pay his rent. But upon catching wind of some robots running amok, he decides to see what he can do about the matter. However, while on his little investigation, he crosses paths with, who else, the robot copy of himself that took his job. If it wasn't obvious yet, this game's story isn't one to take too seriously. Well, initially at least. As Spark goes on his pursuit of his robot doppelganger, whom he proceeds to call Fark, yeah, even the game recognizes that it's a silly sounding name, he gets tangled up in a much greater conflict. The robots running amok are because of a virus infecting robots, courtesy of a very powerful robot known as Freom. He was designed to guard the Megarath, a massive computer tower that mass-produced robots. But being programmed with pure independence, Freom grew to view robots as superior beings and began plotting to wipe out all organic life on the planet. Wait, hold up views robots as superior and wants to wipe out organic life, uses a virus to corrupt machines to do his bidding. I guess we know what happened to Sigma after Mega Man X8 after all. But yeah, it's a pretty straightforward story. Save the world from the evil robot warlord. Though hey, given the clear inspiration from the SNES and Genesis era platformers, a simple story works. As such, most of the dialogue emphasizes the humor more so than character development or stuff like that. And to give the game credit, it does have some pretty funny moments. Such as here, where this cloaked robot named Romalo steals Spark's wallet. Only for Romalo's companion Tropos to note that Spark's not wearing any clothes, and thus has no means of carrying around a wallet. The story Tropos tells afterwards of a prank Romalo pulled on him just adds to the amusement of the scene. Now as for the gameplay, as I kind of noted earlier, Spark the Electric Jester takes clear inspiration from the SNES and Genesis era of platformers, most notably, to no surprise, Sonic the Hedgehog. For instance, the game goes with a level-to-level -level structure. You beat one level, you sometimes get a cutscene, and then you jump right into the next level. Rinse and repeat until the credits roll. Later levels even get split into multiple parts, like the axe system from the 2D Sonic games. However, despite it seeming like one currently, both visually and from how I'm describing it, the game's not quite a Sonic clone. It's definitely got a lot of Sonic in its blood, don't get me wrong, but it's got a few of its own tricks up its sleeves that allow it to stand out. Compared to the 2D Sonic games, Spark has a larger emphasis on combat. Some enemies will go down in one hit, but many of them won't, requiring that you dedicate some time to fighting them. Now for a classic style platformer, combat of this kind could easily be done wrong and just end up feeling repetitive or like it kills the flow. But quite fortunately, Spark manages to, more often than not, avoid this hurdle, all thanks to one of its other key gameplay features. The reason I said this game's not quite a Sonic clone is because it's actually more like a mix of Sonic and, of all games, Kirby. Initially, Spark only has access to the electric abilities provided by his Jester hat, but as you progress through the levels, you get access to a multitude of different copy ability-esque Jester powers. 
These can range from elemental powers, such as fire, wind, and ice, or specific weapons, like swords, magic spells, and hammers. Or even more out there ones, such as the board that basically turns you into a Sonic Riders character, I approve, or just... edgy. It's basically the ninja ability from Kirby, but I just love that the game's straight up just... edgy. And all these aren't just simple, single-use power-ups either. Like the more recent Kirby games, each and every Jester power has its own unique moveset, making all of them feel distinct from one another. And because of that, these powers are useful not just for combat, but for different circumstances in the platforming. Take, for example, this level closer to the end of the game. You're going through this area full of fire and lava that you have to avoid, and it later includes this temporary fire shield to protect you, but it'll only last for so long. However, the level also has a hidden fire power, which when active, makes you completely immune to fire and lava. The fire shield's no longer even needed in this instance. Another great example is the wind power, which gives you access to several tools for traversal, including unlimited air dashing and being able to jump in midair twice. This opens the way to a bunch of different means to get through the levels and find secrets, and as such, I held onto the wind power for most of my playthrough, which I was actually able to, thanks to another genius feature with this system. Taking a page from Super Mario World's book, Spark allows you to store a Jester power while another one is active. Say you have the Wind power up and you pick up the Sword. Sword's active now, and the Wind power gets stored away. And you're able to swap between these powers on the fly with a simple press of a button. And this is largely why I love this gameplay mechanic. Not only are you given a vast number of special powers, each with unique movesets, but you're able to freely swap between two of them at any time and do some crazy things with them. And with how frequently the game offers up Jester powers to pick up, you're encouraged to experience experiment with different combinations of abilities, which I think is really cool. Though of course, none of this would be as effective if it weren't for good controls and good level design, which Spark has both of. Of course, some control elements vary per power, but either way, Spark controls great regardless of which power he's using. Though I will say, his wall jump works rather interestingly. As noted in the game's opening tutorial, unlike most wall jumps, you just need to tilt in the direction of the wall at the start of the wall jump, but from there, just use the jump button. No additional control stick tilting needed. But yeah, it works quite well. And the levels also really help with the experience. Each of the levels have a nice mix of platforming challenges, a hint of non-linear exploration, and plenty of Sonic-like high-speed thrill rides, some of which automated, but some of which of your own making. The sections designed for use with the board especially. Sure, the level's designed to encourage its use, but it's all up to you to make it work out, and it just feels great. Granted, some of the level obstacles can be a bit cheaply placed, but it's a very rare problem. Some of these set pieces are really cool, to be honest. One of those previously mentioned board sections has you basically surfing across sand dunes in the desert, which was incredibly fun. But then you've also got stuff like the penultimate level, where you're infiltrating and destroying some of Freeom's aircrafts from the inside, complete with self-destruct escape sequences. The game's got a nice variety of level settings, so it does a good job of keeping them fresh as you progress. The one level I can't say I'm a big fan of, though, is the final level. Mostly because it kind of just bombards you with enemies, especially these giant battle robots that are really annoying to take down. I died so many times to these guys that I started just zipping past them whenever they showed up. Now fortunately, on the topic of death, that could sound really bad out of context. The game works off an infinite life system, with checkpoints littered throughout each level. As a whole, it balances checkpoint placement pretty well. You generally won't lose a ton of progress after a death. Plus, if you collect enough of these little glowy things and fill up the bar above your health, then you'll get an instant revival after a death, letting you pick up immediately from where you died, which I think is a nice incentive to collect these things. With all that said, let's get to one of my favorite parts of this game, the bosses. They're littered all throughout the game, often with multiple per level. And while some of them are pretty standard, good, but standard, some of them get utterly bonkers. Like, halfway through the game, you go up against this lumber-cutting robot that's been infected, and like, it's this massive battle up in the clouds where he's attacking you from above and from the background, and in the last third, he destroys a good amount of your platform and just... You didn't need to go this hard on a boss that's not even a major character! Though, of course, if we're talking bosses, I'm obligated to talk about the final battle against Freom. So you start by scaling the Mega Raft to catch up to him, you take on Freom's fighter robot before fighting Freom himself, and after you beat him, he takes hold of you. You know, classic, villain's got the upper hand right before the big finale moment. And then Fark, who is revealed to have been made to be a double agent against Freom, ends up super yeeting his super staff to Spark, allowing him to transform into, what else? Super Spark. And then you get to tear through Freom's forces with this cool new power, and then finally, you take on Freom in space. Sure, it's not the most complex boss fight, but the atmosphere and thrill of it all really sells it, especially with the music. Actually, that's another thing. The music in this game is fantastic. 
It does a great job of capturing the excitement of a game like this in each and every level, all while still having each piece feel distinct from one another. Easily my favorite in the game, alongside the song for the final phase of the Free Home fight, is the song for that aircraft destruction stage I mentioned earlier. It does an awesome job of capturing the atmosphere for an all-out attack on the heart of the villain's forces. And while on the topic of technical stuff, let's talk visuals. First off, Sparks got himself a really great design. His default look kind of gives me Rystar vibes, a game that coincidentally was cited as one of the sources of inspiration in Sparks development. And the various gesture powers all give distinct and cool looking revamps to his design. All the other character design work is pretty solid as well. And the environment, my goodness do they look great. Whether it be bustling cities or colorful forests, the game's environments tend to be a really nice treat for the eyes. And speaking of visuals, while the game largely uses the in-game sprites for cutscenes, there's actually a handful of hand-drawn cinematic cutscenes as well. And while simplistic, they've got a fun charm to them. That said, the one issue I have with the game on a technical standpoint is the performance. It didn't happen super often, but occasionally the frame rate would noticeably stutter or just outright super dip. Apparently this issue was even worse at the game's launch, with the game patched afterwards, but yeah, some of that problem does still linger. But with that said, overall, I had a great time with Spark the Electric Jester. While at face value it may seem like a Sonic clone, the way it builds upon the formula and mixes it with another popular platformer series' main mechanic makes for a really standout experience that I really enjoyed for most of my time through it. And hey, if you want more of the game once you're done, beating the game unlocks some new goodies, such as a non-canon campaign with Fark, who actually has a pretty different moveset compared to Spark, and a feature you can toggle that lets you swap between any of the Jester powers on the fly. Now granted, I didn't get far into Fark's campaign, as I quickly realized that I suck at playing as him, but I'll let future me figure that one out. So yeah, I definitely recommend this game. And it's pretty cheap too, only being $9 here in Canada. Certainly worth that at least if you ask me. With that said, it does make me curious on where Lake Fatbird could take this idea if he were to do another Spark game. Maybe some new gesture powers, maybe some experimenting with the level structure, or make it 3D, that works too. So yeah, a few months after Spark the Electric Jester came out, Lake Feppard announced that work had begun on a sequel to the game, which would go on to come out in 2019. However, the big catch was that it was now a 3D platformer. And not just any 3D platformer, more specifically, one in the style of the Sonic Adventure games. And as a very big fan of Sonic Adventure 2, I'm quite excited to see where Lake Feppard takes this idea. Okay, yeah, he's not even being subtle about the source of inspiration. Just look at this menu screen. Seems a little familiar, doesn't it? Though this does give us a chance to take a sneak peek at some of the characters at play in this game. And not only are there a lot of new faces joining in this game, but Spark himself is nowhere to be seen. And that be because, despite the title, Spark's not even in the game beyond a few mentions and a cameo in the game's opening. This time around, the story focuses around Fark. In fact, the game was originally called Fark the Electric Jester, before being renamed to Spark 2. He is now in the care of Dr. Armstrong, the creator of both Freom and the Mega Wrath. He made a brief appearance near the end of the first Spark game, inviting Spark to help in the final attack on Freom, and giving him a massive paycheck for his help, but he's a far more focused on character this time around. Though I will admit, I don't think his design translated perfectly to 3D, particularly the eyes. Stop looking at me like that. But anyway, Dr. Armstrong is helping Fark try to recover anything on his past, as Fark can't even remember his initially given name. Reminder, Fark was a nickname Spark gave him, and given it was meant to mean fake Spark, he's not too thrilled about having it. But before Dr. Armstrong can get the process underway, another robot jester jumps in and steals away the Doctor, with Fark in pursuit. From there, Fark's journey has him trying to find where Dr. Armstrong was taken to, which in turn gets him going up against the forces of Freom, who's gotten himself a new body since his defeat in the first game. Well, kind of, but I'll explain that later. The first thing of note with this game's story is that, while the first game focused generally more on being a fun, lighthearted adventure story, this one takes itself quite a bit more seriously. Not that it lacks humor at all, Romalo comes back and is just an adorable delight when he's around, and the robot that stole Dr. Armstrong, known as EJ, is honestly pretty funny. Not because of anything he says, he's honestly a bit of a try-hard edgy rival, but in the way that everyone treats him. Literally no one has any respect for the guy, and him trying to act all tough and cool just to get humiliated never ceases to be amusing. Like, right after his boss fight, he just gets straight up yeeted off the arena. But beyond those, Spark 2 is a far more complex story with a lot more exposition and a lot more, for lack of a better term, melodrama. 
Fittingly, it is kind of like what those earlier 3D Sonic games were doing, with more of an emphasis on a dramatic narrative, but when a more intense reveal about a character occurs, or spoilers, straight up character deaths, I honestly didn't really feel the impact that I think was wanted. There's also the matter of the big twist about Fark's past, that being that he's actually a creation of Freom, designed to be his eventual successor, as Dr. Armstrong made Freom unable to directly transfer his consciousness out of his original body. All the forms we had seen Freom in beforehand, including the one Spark fought in the first game, were just copies he had made of himself that he was essentially puppeteering. And already that feels a bit convoluted, but then you remember that they said in the first game that Fark was made to pretend to be part of Freom's forces and to eventually backstab him. And admittedly, I could be missing or misunderstanding understanding something here, but this doesn't really line up with what's said about his purpose in this game. Also doesn't quite explain why he was made to look exactly like Spark, let alone to replace him at the circus job, but I think I'm digging too deep into this now. Now regarding the gameplay, like I said earlier, Spark the Electric Gesture 2 introduced a Z-axis into the series, turning the Genesis-style 2D platformer into a Sonic Adventure-esque 3D platformer. Because of that, some compromises were made to some of the gameplay mechanics from the first game. For one, the gesture powers are a lot less prominent in this game. You can hold up to three this time, granted, being able to swap between them with the D-pad on controller, but compared to the 14 gesture powers you had in Spark 1 that all felt distinct and like they served their own purposes both in combat and in platforming, Spark 2 only has five gesture powers. And while I do believe there are proper differences, there definitely doesn't feel as much distinct difference between them all, barring a few elements. While I was willing to experiment with different gesture powers the first time around, this game I used the edgy power pretty much the whole time, if only because it allows you to do three dashes in midair, which is very handy. But yeah, I will admit that I'm a bit disappointed that the gesture powers have less of a prominence this time around, as that system was one of my favorite aspects of the first game. The main use they largely serve now is for combat, which has been made more more of a focus than before. Some enemies will still go down on one hit, but many will require you to stop and take on them in more dedicated fights. I do love me a good beat em up or hack and slash, and if my favorite game of all time's anything to go off of, I'm cool with this kind of combat's presence in platformers so long as it's done well. And Spark 2's is... almost there. Your attacks do have some good speed to them, but the sound design of the hits landed is kinda lacking. And without a proper dedicated lock-on system, you'll sometimes find yourself attacking in the wrong direction and doing nothing. And with a smaller move pool for each gesture power, you're often just gonna find yourself button mashing through the fights. Which again, I'm fine with if done right, but it does feel a bit off in Spark 2's case. Like, I don't know how to properly explain it, but it feels like it wants to commit to being a full-on beat-em-up, but also doesn't want to, so you get this strange in-between. Though to give credit, Two of the combat systems felt good, the homing attack and the parry system. The former's pretty self-explanatory, you've got a Sonic-esque homing attack, more in the style of the later 3D Sonic games with the lock-on, and small enemies can be taken out in one hit with these. For both those cases, and for locking onto springs, this feels solid. And for the latter, you've got a shield button, but if you time your button press to the exact moment the enemy attacks, you can parry it. You can even use this on certain stage hazards, and while the timing can be tricky to get down instantly, it's satisfying to pull off. But of course, Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 weren't known for having beat-em-up combat mechanics, so let's talk about the gameplay influence those games had on Spark 2. Like with the first game, the levels are a good mix of platforming challenges, non-linearity, and high-speed action. The last of which is where you really feel the Sonic Adventure influence. The levels have a lot of grand set pieces for going fast through, but barring moments with dash pads, these aren't automated. You're going to have to still control Fark as you go through them. Now, admittedly, there are some points where the physics aren't going to work in your favor in that regard, especially closer to the end of the game, but that said, more often than not, these moments worked really well. In general, the game does capture that Sonic Adventure feel of high-speed thrills while still being a skill-based platformer. And like with Spark 1, some of the set pieces get pretty cool. One of the game's final levels has you go through this maze of roads, warping from road to road as you traverse the area high speeds. It's super fun and exciting. Heck, the whole final act is really solid in that regard, with the penultimate level being a reimagining of Spark 1's penultimate level that I really liked. Same music and all, or earlier on, this level where you're navigating your way up a train only to fight a giant robot dragon mini boss at the front of the train. Though speaking of which, another quality aspect of Spark 1 that carries over is the bosses. These bosses definitely get tough requiring you to know how to use your parries pretty well. And when you do have that system nailed, man, timing your parries perfectly with the boss's attacks feels really good. Also, I'll be talking about music as a whole shortly, but I've got to mention this. So in true Sonic Adventure fashion, the standard boss theme in this game is just pure Crush 40 style rock. But once you get the boss to low enough health, was 
That's right, there's vocal tracks. These songs are just the epitome of that cheesy Crush 40 goodness that the Sonic Imp were filled with for a good decade or so, and I loved every single moment of it. And that's all before mentioning the song used for the final battle against Free Elm, a vocal rock rendition of the amazing final boss theme from the first game. If there's one thing these two games are great at, it's definitely their sense of spectacle with boss fights. As for the soundtrack as a whole, while I will admit that I'm not as big a fan of it as I was with the first games, it does still have a pretty solid OST, especially those songs I mentioned earlier. And regarding visuals, aside from how weird Dr. Armstrong looks, I think this game looks pretty good. The other characters translated much better to 3D than Dr. Armstrong did, and the environments are pretty solid as well. And unlike the first game, I actually didn't come across any performance issues, which was honestly very impressive. But yeah, overall, Spark the Electric Gesture 2 is a pretty good game. It definitely doesn't nail everything it tries to do, but given this was new territory for Lake Feppard, I can't really hold that against him. This was a pretty bold experiment for what was largely a one-man indie team, and I'd say overall, it paid off. It was certainly more fun than basically the last decade's worth of 3D Sonic games at least, and I think even more so than going from Spark 1 to Spark 2, I'm really curious and excited to see how Lake Feppard builds upon this game with Spark 3. He's got a really good base work here, but there's also a fair amount of room for improvement. And I suppose we'll be finding out at some point in the near future, because Spark the Electric Gesture 3 was indeed revealed to be in development in late 2020. Now this game is still in the works, and with no estimated release date yet, but there is a publicly released demo for it. So let's quickly take a look at this demo and see what's up with Spark's upcoming adventure. Which yes, Spark has returned to the main character role for Spark 3. So the demo opens up with... a racing game section. I really can't escape this genre now, can I? Interestingly, the gameplay of this portion is actually a reference to XF, a racing game that Lake Feppard has been on and off developing over the years. But yeah, after the racing section, you're on foot as Spark, now sporting a jacket. I guess he's got somewhere to put his wallet now. So going off this demo, the core gameplay is pretty similar to Spark 2's, but I gotta say, there's been a lot of refinement. The physics feel more stable, Spark feels even better to control than Fark did, and thank goodness, the combat's seen a notable improvement. Remember how I said it felt like Spark 2 didn't know if it wanted to fully commit to being a beat-em-up? Well, Spark 3 is looking to actually commit to it, as they've not only added a damage multiplier that increases by stringing together unique combos, but there's a ton of different attacks Spark can do by mixing together light and heavy attack inputs. And that's on top of the additional moves you can unlock from the in-game shop. Oh yeah, Spark 2 also had a shop, but it was just to purchase Jester Powers and Art Gallery pieces, so I just kind of ignored it. But Spark 3's shop sells new melee attacks, additional equipable abilities, upgrades to your already existing abilities, and finally Jester Powers, which don't seem to be collectibles in levels this time around. Though in the demo, there's only one Jester Power available, some sort of Reaper Jester. Which on that note, I am cool with the existence of a Reaper Jester. More beat-em-ups need scythe weapons. But even the level format has been altered. There's still the standard level style as before, but some levels actually give you different objectives than just get to the end. Two of the demo's levels put you in more open areas, one requiring you to collect enough metal scattered around before the timer runs out, and the other requiring you to get your score high enough before the timer runs out. There's also these special challenges that test you on a particular ability's usage, such as the polished up homing attack, or Jester Dash as it's known. Heck, as a whole, this game's feeling a lot more polished up compared to Spark 2. I'm very excited to see more of what Lake Feppard's got planned for this one. And before anyone asks, I'll likely try to find an opportunity to talk about the full game in video form once it's out. But yeah, that's the Spark the Electric Jester series in its current state. Gotta say, I'm quite impressed by the overall quality all these games showcase. Even with Spark 2's weaker aspects, it was still a solid time. Lake Feppard seems to have himself a pretty solid track record, and given that, I'm quite excited for the full release of Spark 3, and for whatever other endeavors he may have planned in the future. But that's all I've got for this time around. So with that said, this has been Black Mage Benjamin, and until the next video, have a nice day everybody.